Welcome, everybody. We are just going to let the uh, audience uh, roll in while we open up the virtualization of care webinar tonight. Uh, this uh, this beautiful December evening, uh, we're going to be talking about the virtualization of care for the 65 plus population, the 50 plus population, if you're talking to AARP and Sheila Collins, one of our guests tonight. <laughs> Uh, and we are looking forward to a wonderful conversation with uh, four major leaders of the U.S. healthcare digital health ecosystem for people that are uh, 50 and older. Uh, and uh, again, this is brought to you by Epicure, uh, one of the digital health technology leaders in the uh, aging in place and aging at home space. And thank you, Epicure, for your uh, generous support of this program tonight. Uh, tonight we have with us a, a group of folks who have been passionate about uh, aging in place uh, for their careers and uh, age tech uh, as it's known. Uh, they include uh, Sheila Collins from the AARP Innovation Lab, Scott Becker, the founder and uh, what, of Becker's Healthcare Review, Becker's Hospital Review, you know, one of the the national leaders in, the, in, in healthcare for uh, many decades now. Uh, Perry Avaton, uh, the CEO of a startup uh, agent, agent place age tech uh, company that is uh, experienced, who has experienced rapid growth over the last 10 months with the, um, the onset of COVID around the country. And Lee Shapiro, uh, managing uh, partner at uh, Sevenwire, uh, recently uh, departed CFO for Livongo and board member of many companies. Uh, check his LinkedIn profile. Uh, it's like a ticker symbol. You're going to just have to go on there. To, I can't even begin to list them all. But um, one of the uh, one of the, the rare unicorns in digital healthcare, and up until about five years ago, the word unicorn in digital healthcare didn't exist. So because of Lee and his, his uh, partner in crime, Glenn Tolman, uh, we are now in the midst of uh, uh, seeing uh, digital health unicorns and which is just wonderful to see as someone who's been teaching and researching in this space for 30 years and no one even knew what it was. So thank you, Lee, for bringing the, uh, the uh, digital health ecosystem to the front pages of the Wall Street Journal and CNBC. So with that, we want to actually dive a little bit further into uh, each person's uh, background. Uh, Sheila, if you could lead off and give us a couple of minutes about uh, yourself, that would be wonderful. Sure. So first of all, thank you for having me, Stan. I'm really excited about being here. I work for ARP Innovation Labs, and I focus on identifying the best and brightest startups in the health tech space who are really helping people age well. So it, I think about it as an extension of our mission, which is all about empowering people to choose how they age. My background is in marketing, innovation, and e-commerce. And when I think about digital health, this is very personal. It's I have a mom who is aging in place. She's in her 80s, and there are so many health challenges that she's facing, and I'm a long-distance caregiver. She's in New York, and I'm in D.C. And so when I think about digital health, it's also about finding ways to make her life better, make her life easier. And so I'm excited to talk tonight about some of the things that we're seeing in this space. That's wonderful, wonderful. And uh, really good to have you here as well. Uh, Sheila, just, just wonderful to have you on the panel and, and the perspective you're bringing is absolutely fantastic. Uh, next up is again, Lee Shapiro, Managing Partner of Seven Wire Ventures uh, and uh, Digital Health uh, entrepreneur extraordinaire, <laughs> Lee. Can you give us a couple of minutes about your background? I'm dying to hear how you present yourself. So please, sure, just a couple sure. minutes about your nope. background. Lee Shapiro, I'm chairman of the Stan Ketchnowski and HitLab fan club. Woo! And also have been involved in the digital health space uh, for as long as all this gray hair deserves uh, that I'm able to show off for all of you. Um, and in, a, in a approaching, an approaching seniorhood. So I'm very interested in, in this space. Um, but Sheila said something that's quite interesting and that we align with at Sevenwire. We look to build companies that help create informed and connected health consumers, really to solve the hassles that we all face in managing our health. And 
empowering people to make choice is really a, a very important aspect of what we believe will lead to better outcomes in health. None of us want to be a patient. I think all of us aspire to be healthy. And that's what we look to achieve through the companies that we back at Sevenware. Um, we are now in our second Connected Consumer Fund with that theme. Um, my co-founder and I, Glenn Tolman, have been investing for close to 30 years in using technology to address broken business process. And for those of you in healthcare, you know there's enough broken process to last a lifetime. And so we're, we're very busy in this market. Stan, back to you. No, Lee, thank you. And that, that's a great way to put it, uh, broken business processes. And I think there's certainly a number of those in healthcare. So it uh, looks like you're never going to retire. Sorry to hear that. But uh, we'll be seeing you for the next 50 years, starting up companies to fix the healthcare system. Um, and, and next up is another Chicagoan. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what's happening with Chicago these days, but they're just sprouting uh, digital health leaders all over the place. Uh, Scott Becker is the, the, found, the founder and, and uh, you know, again, Becker's Hospital Review, Becker's Healthcare Review. If you haven't been receiving their emails on a daily basis, I would highly recommend jumping over to Google and Googling them and getting on their subscription list. It is some of the most informative healthcare and hospital content out there today. I, have, I get it all the time. Uh, HitLab tweets it uh, a lot. Uh, and one of the more interesting pieces is that just the hospital bankruptcies over the last 10 months are extraordinary. Uh, so again, while our healthcare frontline workers are doing great things, they're under a lot of strain. But again, Scott Becker, huge leader. Scott, can you give us a couple of minutes about your background? Sure. Good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm not sure if you could see me or not, but um, Scott Becker, again, I'm the founder, publisher, chief content officer of Becker's Healthcare. Becker's Healthcare is a digital media business, also conferences. Of course, we're out of conferences this year. Uh, we've been in the digital media healthcare area before there was digital media and healthcare. Literally founded the company 28 years ago. Now it's led by a magnificent president and CEO, Jessica Cole, great editorial leadership in Molly Gamble. Uh, and we focus on hospitals and health systems, health IT, surgery centers, orthopedics and spine, and trying to be deep in the areas that we're in. Uh, separately by background, I'm a Harvard Law graduate, for better or for worse, also a University of Illinois uh, you know, alumni, so a uh, fan of the U of I, and love Sheila at the University of Michigan, for okay. better or for worse, as, as well. Um, a partner at a large law firm ran the healthcare national practice for 15 years, served on the board of directors. They've really straddled the two worlds of healthcare and healthcare law forever. Uh, but really, most people know me today through Becker's Hospital Review, and a great pleasure it gives me a chance to visit with magnificent and interesting people, and just a great privilege to visit with uh, you know people throughout the healthcare ecosystem and, and fascinating to watch, particularly as the world evolves now and continues to evolve. Fantastic. Thank you, Scott. And I uh, really appreciate you taking the time out to be here. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Perry Avaton, the founder and CEO of Live Care, uh, one of the fastest growing companies right now in remote patient monitoring and age, age tech, aging at home, age in place. Um, and uh, Perry has promised me, even though he's an Israeli living in New York City, <clears throat> and he promises not to speak at a thousand words per minute. Perry, two minutes on your background, please. Thank you, Stan. Thank you, everybody, for having me here. I, uh... As I said, I spent my first 21 years growing up in Israel and uh, the past 22 years in the United States. Uh, next year is a crucial year, breaking even. I um, spent the past almost 18 years in healthcare IT, looking at the elderly population, started at looking at solutions to uh, uh, seniors aging at nursing homes, uh, subacute facilities and assisted living facilities the past four years. We, as we follow the trend, we uh, look at solutions at patients' homes and aging in place was our you know, main mission. While we investigated the, you know, the solutions that are in aging in place, we found that the best solution out there is a button that the, pa the patients or the elderly has to press while they're on the floor. And we refuse to accept that as a fact that you know, patients will press a button while they're on the floor already. So we look at how we, get the help to the seniors rather than seniors calling for help ahead of time and be proactive on how we uh, uh, collecting data from patient zones. So the, the first incentive was to really look at the smartphones and smartphones uh, didn't deliver well the solution for elderly is because 
Today, if you look at elderly that age in place, just to start with, they're getting blood pressure devices, they're getting pulse sacs, they're getting body weight scales, and that's just to start. And then you're getting the glucometers and all the sensors, patches, and each one of them come with his own uh, software, with own Bluetooth pairing, <laughs> and no game. So that's how we basically found the Link Plus, which is the very first smart home uh, gateway, medical gateway. The Link Plus basically worked as at the background, collecting data from all the medical peripherals at the home. So patients will use the peripherals as they always do, as they always done before. And the Link Plus will collect the data automatically without the need to pair, without the need to install any apps. And we worked uh, hard in the past three years to onboard every peripheral in CVS, do and read uh, some of the base by health. And all these peripherals automatically pair, deliver data, straight to the uh, caregiver, to the platforms. And um, as you said, we launched our product at the beginning of this year, not knowing about COVID. And it turns to be uh, a very uh, challenging year as we had to onboard thousands of patients while we were preparing ourselves to a smooth self onboarding. And uh, the results are uh, saving lives of a lot of elderly during COVID, uh, getting a lot of alerts, we generated almost 60,000 alerts in the past uh, about nine months and generated about 400,000 endpoints of data from peripherals and other endpoints. So I'm uh, excited to discuss. I couldn't tell. Yeah, it was hard to tell you were excited, but you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's good to see you on, on the program tonight. We appreciate you joining us. And again, you know, again, a New York City company and uh, a student of mine at uh, Columbia Business School uh, Executive Ed Digital Health Program. Uh, and Perry, by the way, will be the first uh, certificate in business excellence in digital health, uh, which will give him permanent Columbia Business School alumni status. And uh, which means that he'll take a lot more programs and courses with Lee Shapiro, of course, and Scott Becker and, and Sheila Collins. So uh, yeah, again, Perry, thank you for that background. Uh, Let's start off with Sheila. You know, Sheila, ARP is one of the most influential organizations in America, one of the most trusted organizations in, in America. Uh, ARP has an innovation lab in age tech and, and is doing a lot in age tech. Now with the, the pandemic, it's that age tech is front and center for what everyone's talking about. They tell us a little bit about the labs, though, in case, you know, for whatever reason, people in the audience don't know about it. Yeah, sure. So the ARP Innovation Lab, as you mentioned, is focused on age tech, but also looking at everything from health tech, um, fintech, as well as products around self-fulfillment. The Innovation Lab uh, finds the best and brightest startups in three different ways. We host pitch competitions across the country or now across the virtual web um, to identify those startups. We also hold something called challenges. And this is when we're looking at a specific topic that we want to address. How do we address security and aging? How do we address uh, learning and aging? Things of that nature. Then the third way is that we partner with accelerators to work with startups from those accelerators. Two of those partners happen to be Mass Challenge as well as Upward Labs. When we're not in a pandemic, we are situated in a 10,000 square foot space and we invite the innovation community to join us for different events, as well as uh, we host different components like demo days and things of that nature. Um, the Innovation Lab works with these startups to really help them scale and identify opportunities that will connect them to opportunities in the longevity economy. When we think about the longevity economy, we think about all of the ways and connections that helps someone age well. And that economy is slated at $8.3 trillion. Like that number is huge. And so there are many ways that we work with those startups. One aspect is we have a design thinking practice and that's all about making sure the human is at the center of our designs and that we connect them with consumers in that demographic to make sure that their voice is part of all of those design practices. Another way is that we mentor and we do coaching with these startups. We also do business development. And then this year, we made a shift in 
making investments in these startups. And so um, that is another component of the things that we offer at ARP Innovation Labs. And then when we think about age tech and why it's so important is because our demographics are getting older. And all of these stats that I'm gonna share are pre-COVID, so these numbers may have changed. But what we do know is that the, our, there is a big demographic shift of people getting older and therefore there's a lot of new needs. Um, every single day, 10,000 people are turning 65. So happy birthday to you if that happens to be one of the people who are listening today. We also know that by 2050, 25% of the population is expected, the world population is expected to be over 60. And so the needs for the population change in terms of looking for solutions around healthcare, tech-enabled home care, thinking about ways to monitor um, monitor your your own health. And so when when Privy talked about live care, I think about those types of solutions that are really on the cutting edge and really helping to solve for one of the things that we know and that we hear all the time is that people want to age in place. People want to age at home. And so we're looking for those startups who are bringing those solutions to make that a reality, to make that possible. I love it. And, and just a couple of quick follow-up questions. Do you guys charge any fees or take any equity for the folks in your labs? So for the startups who we invest in, there is a equity um, component to it. Yes. Okay. So if you don't invest in them, then you don't take any equity or fees. Correct. Okay. And that, that's wonderful. What a great program. And I think <clears throat> we have a, obviously a lot of people in the uh, audience today and, and, you know, I can just, re I recognize some of their names and some of them are from age tech startups. And so they're definitely going to want to know that if they don't know that already, they probably do. <laughs> so along that, along those lines, Lee Shapiro, um, you know, it's, uh, it's been a rough year, obviously uh, it's been an extraordinary year. Again, uh, like all scripts wasn't enough. You went back to it and you decided to transform American healthcare again with Lavongo. And, um, you know, it's extraordinary what, what's happened and uh, the, just the year that you've had. Um, I don't know many uh, American uh, business people that can claim the kind of uh, success that, some, that you and Glenn and your team have put together this year to, it's, in digital health. I think it might be unprecedented. I don't have to go back to the record books. But when you now look across the landscape and you see the virtualization of the U.S. healthcare system, obviously spiking, we don't know where it's going to fall back to, kind of thesis, antithesis, what do you see and where do you see H tech and, and this kind of um, category of investment, the category of digital tech, what role do you see it playing in the US healthcare system going forward during COVID and then afterwards? So I, I heard Satya Nadella um, speak about the 10 year acceleration that we've had in the 10 months since the COVID-19 pandemic really became paramount in, in our vocabulary. And that's true for cloud solutions. That's true for uh, telecommuting. It's also true for healthcare. Um, I like the analogy of uh, the toothpaste is out of the tube because the genie you can probably coax back into the bottle, but the toothpaste, not so easy to get back into the tube. And that's what we have with regard to uh, digital health. I, I believe, Stan, that you know, within the next five years, frankly, if not sooner, that we won't be talking about digital health. It's just the way healthcare is practiced. Um, it is just another way in which we engage from a healthcare standpoint. And, and these tools are ones that are going to facilitate the type of environment that Sheila was speaking about, which is people want, and in many cases need to be cared for where they are. That may be at home, that may be when they're traveling, that may be at work, and, and use of these tools that allow for sharing of, of data and, and situational evidence, if you will, is going to be critical in providing the type of diagnosis that we need to fully assess where someone is in their care journey. Um, frankly, from a personal standpoint, I don't like going into the doctor's office sharing my symptoms and then having the doctor basically use population metrics and say, well, 
other people with those symptoms have taken this medication or have needed these tests. So we'll do the same thing for you. I'd rather have some tests in advance and have the treatment a little bit more personalized. And that's what digital health provides, re remote monitoring, the types of tools that, that Perry is talking about that can deliver insights from where you are is going to provide a, a level of understanding at an individual level that we need in terms of delivery of care that will also lead to better outcomes. And that, that's really at the crux of the situation. Uh, so yeah, really interesting. I think the, um, uh, you know, when, where, where the rubber hits the road over the next 10 months and, or seven months, whatever it's gonna take to begin to tail out of this uh, will be enormous. And, and Perry, again, life care, you, you outlined a little bit in your introduction. Um, it, it's really at the heart of what's happening. You know, telemedicine, remote patient monitoring, there are some components of the digital healthcare system that are just outpacing all the rest. And uh, certainly we saw that with Livongo and Teladoc and the, the diffusion of those technologies into not just uh, the US healthcare system broadly, but specifically with employers, health plans, and the institutions that really are responsible for the rapid diffusion of new systems, new models, new, new frameworks, period. Um, when you look at uh, the, 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 the technologies that you're deploying at the home, um, tell us, I mean, just off the bat, what's your, what's your favorite one? Which one do you see uh, that's wow. just uh, picking up the most signals and the easiest to deploy and that, and that sort of thing? Well, so it depends, right? So, so we, there were, before, before COVID, right, there, there was a huge debate. Are we going to monitor our patients? And I'm talking about the elderly population, right? Are we going to monitor them? on wearables or devices that are on a desk where they use on and off. And then it's pretty much become, pretty much became a, a, a combination of both because there is a massive amount of data on their Fitbits. There's massive, massive amount of data on all these peripherals. And now in addition now, right? And I'm gonna answer your question. But now in addition now, there is, there, is, there is also continuum care. So you're looking at continuous care as a new challenge where all these um, sensors on mattresses, right? Uh, all these sensors on the walls, checking their room temperature, light temperature, light and temperature, uh, uh, big impact on falling, and not just the heart rate and the food you eat. So looking at getting a, a full variety of data is, is where we're focusing on. And my favorite actually is, is all these continuous care patches. So something like, I'm not gonna tell the name for now, all right, but it's just, one patch that actually check you temperature and heart rate at the same time. And thanks to a full-time gateway that can do that in the background, now we can go to a patient automatically while the patients pretty much do anything they want. We're gonna check every 30 minutes, their temperature, their heart rate and SpO2 while they don't even have to take the virus. So that's fascinating. And taking the fact that elderly go to their programs coming back home because aging in place, it's also mean you have to leave your house. Right, so you go to adult daycare, you go to your programs, and you're coming back, and then there's you captured a lot of data. How many steps did you walk? Um, well, what did you eat? What you uh, glucose level? And you walk home, and then we take that data without you doing nothing, and that that's very valuable. So the patches are great, the uh, sensors for the mattress are great, and the more data that we combine between medical data, like all these peripherals, to environmental data, that's a unique combination on if you attach it to the chronic uh, disease that the patient is handling, then you're taking the chronic disease, you're taking the environmental data and attach it to a medical data that gives you a complete, um, you know, complete picture on the patient's condition. And now we can predict in the next, God forbid, five days, this X, Y might fall. Or in the next two weeks, there is a risk of heart failure or stroke. So, uh, and we, uh, try to stay agnostics on the platform side, right? So we go to telehealth platforms, telehealth companies and say, walk away from all these tablets, <laughs> walk away from all these multiple peripherals and bring your own device is the future. Uh, the health systems are not interested of uh, funding blood pressure, funding pulse ox scales and all these peripherals. They say, go pick your own device. And that, that's a big challenge. Think about, uh, patient walk into a pharmacy and you look at a shelf and there's a lot of devices. Which device is compatible with the platform that I'm using? Which, which peripherals is good enough? So the fact that we managed to onboard the majority of peripherals, all the health systems, the doctors and 
the telehealth company has to do is just provide the link plus. And now all, every peripheral you come, not even initial setup, the minute you use it, it's engaged and send data. So um, my favorite, a lot. So the ones on the bed, the mattress on the bed, because when you sleep, sleep monitoring is better. Uh, and the, the temperature uh, continuous patch. So those are great during COVID. Yeah, I think I think it's tough. It is tough. There's there are some, and obviously the remote monitors are so critical today as we're looking at the the need to have at home uh, monitoring automatically, passively collecting data. And uh, a lot of the the colleagues that we have in life science companies and hospitals, it, it's all about passive data collection. They need that passive data collection. Any manual data collection just does not work with the patient. They just don't have. The interest it reminds them that they're sick and they it's just you know it's very difficult to kind of remember to do that stuff on a regular basis and scott you're you're one of the foremost leaders in what's going on in the hospital system right now in the country um i think you, you're probably tied into every c-suite out there um what are you seeing hospitals utilizing when it comes to uh monitoring and, and, and aging in place tech at the home right now uh to to really help reduce the icu load, which is at unprecedented rates, I think 100,000 ICU beds, and they're fully booked right now. And 18,000 of those, I think, are, IC, are ICU for PEDS or PICU or whatever. It's just crazy. Uh, what, what are hospitals doing these days? Sure. So I'll sort of take this through a couple different quick iterations, and I'll, I'll be conscious of the time. First, I'll talk about quickly just aging in place and what the demographics look like just very quickly. And then we'll talk about what hospitals do with this. So I divide, and I'd love to hear Perry Lee's and Sheila's thoughts on this, and Sheila probably has as much insight as anybody on this, but I divide the aging in place, the elderly, into two broad categories. I could do it by age, but it's deeper than age. There's 55 to 70, and then there's sort of 70 plus, 70 plus but there's broad differences in that, because you could have 80-year-olds that are highly healthy, highly technically advanced, and you could have 60-year-olds that are not, and that are frail and not in good shape. But you divide these groups into differences based on both age, technological proficiency, and, and, and how comfortable they are. Right now, you've got, in sort of the COVID era, you've got a couple different things going on. You've got a ton of seniors delaying all kinds of care, not getting care, um, and, and they're used to very traditional ways of getting care. You do have this evolution where the, the numbers reported are 60% or so of seniors have had a telehealth visit of some sort, but the number that have had a virtual visit, uh, texting visit beyond telehealth is much, much lower, more like 20, 30%. You've also got the situation when you look at our elderly population, you've got 80% at least have cell phones, but you still have 10, 20% that don't even have cell phones, that don't, don't have the technological ability to do a lot of these things. And depending upon their own capability, their own technological proficiency and so forth. And there's all this discussion of, obviously the younger generation is much more computer native than the elderly generation. I mean, I see that I'm 56 and I'm somewhere in between, but I'm much less computer native than my kids are. My parents, my mother's very well advanced in this. My father's not as well advanced, but this is the demographics of America. There, there's 20% that just don't even have cell phones. So you've got this challenge of movement towards virtual health, telehealth, with COVID, people scared to go to health systems, go to emergency rooms and so forth. People were starting to get comfortable going back. You know, we moved from a 10% virtual visits in the country, and we could speak to this better than anybody, to 90 plus percent. Now those numbers have moved back down in terms of numbers of virtual visits. Kaiser was already at 50, 60% because of this sort of model of healthcare they deliver because they were in an at-risk type of value-based system. The rest of the world is not. The rest of the world is five, 10 percent or so. After COVID, I think, as, as we said, you won't think about it as digital health, telehealth, you'll think of it as health. Virtual visits will be 30 to 80 percent of healthcare, and we'll just think of that. That's how it is for the elderly population. It's much more challenging. You've seen hospitals, and and many people have said this: hospitals advance in terms of digital health. You know, 10 years and six months, and and there's no question that's really the, the case. There were systems like Jefferson Health that were more advanced than others to start this with. They were able to get quicker along with this, but most all systems have moved very quickly in this. In terms of the elderly, this is really something that is the systems are really just continuing to learn to get better and better at dealing with their elderly and aged population in terms of virtual visits and telehealth. I mean, systems have been learning on the go for all kinds of patients, 
in the elderly patients often can add another dilemma to it or another challenge to it. And I think what I see throughout the country is vast acceleration in this, improvement in this, but still a long way to go. There's still just a lot of, you know, a lot of systems that are trying to get better and better at this. And, and with, you know, with solutions like Covango and EMWell and all kinds of other companies, American Well and so forth and so on, but they're trying to get better at it and trying to embrace it and still trying to figure this out in terms of seniors, no, no question. And, and, and obviously, I'm talking really about traditional virtual visits, um, but you, you add on to this the different ty- type of diagnostics, the other kinds of things. And these pose real problems at every age, but particularly for the elderly. And what I see with systems is everybody's embraced digital health very quickly. The systems have got a billion times better at it. And, and the companies like Clavango, the way out in front of this, have been a huge accelerant to this, just incredibly helpful to making it all work. And now you're at a spot where there still is a ton of work done to make this work, both with aging seniors, plus in urban and rural communities where the technology, the the Wi-Fi, the the internet doesn't work as well sometimes. You know, half the time it's out in some places and so forth. So it's it's really an evolution, I would say. And I see when I talk with health systems, they are still in the first several innings of this, as opposed to the next level thinking of. How do we focus on a solution for the 83-year-old who has different needs than the 27-year-old? I mean, I think we're still in that evolution stage of getting better and better and just starting to learn how we're going to, you know, slice and dice sort of communities to make sure we're really serving communities well with telehealth and virtual health. Stan, let me turn it back to you. Actually, I'm not going to let you turn it back to Stan. I'm going to ask you a question, Scott. Um, So... You know, some of the things that, that we're starting to see in this space um, are, broadly speaking, hospital at home companies. Health systems are partnering with organizations to deliver, deliver services at home. So think about the surgery may take place in an ambulatory surgery center, um, and someone, rather than being admitted to a hospital, is going home where they can be monitored with a live care like solution. There may be a nurse there for 24 hours with um, some of the home infusion, but for, I'd say, low risk patients, so seniors that are at low risk that you're not worried may have a cardiac event after a hip replacement, um, being in the comfort of your home and sleeping in your own bed and not getting woken up, you know, 40 times and being asked 15 times about advanced directives by everybody who comes into the room, like, like, that's going to make for a far better experience. And some health systems are starting to partner with these organizations to do that. Um, what, are you, what are you seeing in that regard? And, and what do you think are some of the obstacles um, to that occurring? Sure. Because there's a different risk profile with regard to delivery. As you start extending more and more services to the home, um, it, it adds a certain level of risk because environments are not necessarily all the same. A hundred percent, Lee, and it's a, it's a great question. What you've seen over the last 10 to 20 years is the evolution of sort of total joints, knee surgeries, now spine being done more and more less invasive and more and more quick discharge from the hospital. So over the last 10 to 20 years, and now there's the, the new term for it, of course, is hospital at home, which now means all kinds of different things beyond sort of home health. But you've seen for a period of time, surgery centers and hospitals releasing places, patients to convalescent care facilities, re- recovery care facilities, even hotels in some places, and now increasingly to homes. And, and it's really the same kinds of issues. Is the patient safe enough to go off to their own direction? Do they need live help watching them for that period of time? For a period of time, people were released to go to recovery care facilities in California, convalescent care facilities, and the, and the state laws differ on this broadly as to how you can release patients, as does Medicare reimbursement for what you can get reimbursed for in a surgery center or an outpatient surgery versus a hospital surgery. What you see is a, 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 a confluence of issues that really go to the point you're, you're saying, is it minimally invasive enough? Is it safe? Is the patient of the profile where they're likely to be okay? Can they be monitored through equipment of the type and devices and software as a service of the type that companies like yours offer or do they need an actual nurse, an actual person? When you start moving towards actual staffing at home, this ends up being the kind of thing that, even though everybody talks about it, 
When you start really talking about staffing at home or having to have people at home, you end up with, instead of having a cost structure that ends up being remarkable, you often end up with unintended consequences of crazy cost in the long run. So when I, when I look at this, I differentiate it but it's very much broadly into two different segments. We've been seeing this release from hospitals and surgery centers for short care recovery or home care recovery over the last several years and going back for a long time in some places. But I look at it very broadly as the cost structure will work, work great if the relatively safe, safe patients and they could be monitored with technology. That will work great in the long run. If in contrast, the patients that are getting released from the hospital or a surgery center and actually need nurse or aides to watch them or watch the patients, then you're likely to not have nearly the kind of cost help that we were that, that people hope for when they talk about hospital home and, and so forth, just to, to look into this two very broad categories. And there are a bunch of state and federal laws that deal with this as well. Uh, oh. think, yeah, Sheila, just going off of that, I think we, got, we have a question from the audience asking about the adoption rate. Pre-COVID, the adoption rate for this technology, as I'm sure your labs had seen, was, was really struggling. Obviously with COVID, it's a whole new ball game. And what do we think is going to happen post-COVID? Obviously, you know, where do you think it's going uh, within, you know, not the next seven months necessarily, but you know, in 2022 and beyond? I think when when I think about the adoption rate, again, healthcare is so complicated. So uh, one of the big um, components is what gets reimbursed and um, what is the connectivity. So as Scott was talking about. Um, the nurse being at home and the monitoring, there is a lot of care coordination that needs to be combined in order for the solutions, a lot of these solutions to work. Um, what we did see when it comes to telehealth and telemedicine uh, in, in, in the area of seniors and those who are in Medicare, um, telemedicine skyrocketed or telehealth skyrocketed 300%. And that's because there was a need. There was the demand and supply that was t that took a shift um, because first there was not enough in the on the patient side. There were not enough on the doctor side. And then the pandemic hit. And I think it was Lee who said, you know, it pushed us 10 months, pushed us 10 years forward with this um, type of need in terms of seniors 50 plus and adopting technology we're seeing those adoptions increase. What, what folks want to know is that their information is safe, their information is secure. So there is a trust factor that needs to be, be there and that trust factor needs to be provided um, by those who are providing the technology or those who are using the technology to help them know that their information is secure, that their information is gonna be used correctly um, so there's that component um, there, but we're we are seeing upticks in the adoption of all sorts of technology. Brilliant. And, and Perry, you're in the middle of that adoption cycle, that diffusion battle. You're in the trenches there every day. You're trying to you're trying to understand how to you know stay with the tornado. Now, what's going to happen after COVID? Where, what's your gut telling you? Uh, that all of this remote tech and this aging in place tech will be in 22 and beyond? Where do you think we're going to land uh, as the tree swings back to more normal? Well, before I'm jumping to my crystal ball and tell you what I see in terms of <laughs> <laughs> the next year or two, I, I want to comment on two things. First of all, Scott mentioned hospital at home, right? So things like that can only happen uh, if, we, if we can go through what uh, Sheila mentioned, which is uh, how do we protect the data? How do we really secure the data? Not only on expectation of privacy, but we're talking about cyber attacks and other things that are, you know, happen every day. Um, so, so one of the things that I found, uh, uh, you know, can be beneficial to to the issue is is uh, basically consolidated data. Right. As long as we having the data diverse to so many channels, that that can create, you know, that, that can create a higher risk. It basically increases the risk of of hacking uh, cell phones, of hacking uh, home, home routers, computers. So data consolidation is one of other things that we're working on. And today we come into the telehealth platforms, to the home health, to the telehealth companies and say, 
We're giving you a single integration to a single API, HO7, raw data, you, you decide. And we're giving you a single integration that is protected by high trust HIPAA. And now you get one, ch one channel of data that you know, protected and, and that, that's one thing that I, I wanted to mention. And uh, one more comment about the hospital at home. Take a look at the hospital's rooms. You, you can, it's so many units, so many devices. And now we have to consolidate hardware too. And, and we're looking at it and see the progress that uh, companies like Levango and companies like other companies in, in the industry, the way, they, the way they're focusing on, on a community at a time. So I, um, if I correct me if I'm wrong, Lee, but I, I heard you one of, the one of the classes says that, that you uh, predicting that just in India itself in the next five years is gonna be more diabetic patient than the entire US population. That's it here since the day you say that, and that's fascinating. So, so companies like Levango that focusing focused for years on, on the diabetic patient. Uh, and I think the way we uh, work at life care is we want to focus on the elderly population. And if I'll tell you two years ago that we do remote patient monitoring, you will know immediately that we do uh, we're dealing with elderly. But since uh, COVID, uh, it's become a mainstream. Every family do telehealth, every family now have remote patient monitoring. And uh, the challenge with the elderly is mainly on a scaling. And, and because they're very difficult to scale due to the, you know, the lack of technology solutions for that type of community. So then what happened is the priorities are going toward those are easy to scale. So a uh, primary care physician mainly left with a single incentive, which is uh, the reimbursement for Medicare. All these CPT codes, but even there, it's not you know it's not uh, uh, so perfect. So right now, uh, the, when we engage with telehealth platforms, and I'm going to leave the names aside, we we <clears throat> we enter to 15 to 20 percent compliant with those uh, CPT codes like 994544578, basic CPT code. Before you even get into chronic care management G codes, those are very difficult to be compliant because you have to babysit. The patients on taking vitals, make sure you comply. And using using a, a automated system like the Link Plus that collects the data automatically, and all, not only that, also we have two-way video capability in a gateway, and it's a fully cellular, so you don't have to worry about connecting to Wi-Fi. We increase compliance to more than seventy percent. That creates more money to the providers. They're motivated to onboard more patients. And uh, back to the crystal ball, uh, we're going to edge in place. Um, by choice, not just because there is no hospital's beds available, not just because uh, uh, the nursing home is fully occupied, uh, because the hospital is over occupied. We're going to age in place by choice because it's now possible to do so. You don't have to, uh, you know, you don't have to be, to take a, a class in IT to operate your home peripherals anymore. So we're going to age in place by choice. We live longer, like uh, Sheila mentioned. So what we have to now, 55, 54 million seniors living in the United States, 2.1 billion globally. They, that's, that's no longer a, a sector in the industry. That's the industry. And that industry needs solutions. And we motivated and dedicated to provide those solutions. And uh, if, if, you know, if you open a telehealth platform two, three years ago, you're a startup. Today, a telehealth platform is a solution. So solution, industry, tools, we're here to, we're committed to provide those tools to the industry. That's fantastic. And again, yeah, I, I wish you were more excited about it, Perry. I, don't, I, I can't feel any energy, uh, any, any passion. I don't, so you, so I don't talk too fast. So. For what you do. <laughs> Lee, Lee, are you okay? <laughs> Just coming through, yeah. You gotta love it. Um, so Lee, let, let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the five-year trend. You guys at Seven Wire, uh, your team is, is one of the tops in the country in looking at trends and being able to pick out which trends are gonna to come to fruition. Uh, you're talking to national leaders, international leaders all the time about you know, where, where things are happening. You saw Kaiser uh, kick off their virtual HMO in Northern California a couple of months ago, last month, United kicked off a smaller one in Minnesota. Again, just testing the market, kind of seeing what's out there in terms of virtual HMO. So there's a lot of change that's, gonna, that, that's, that's taking place. We don't know where it's gonna go in the next five years. What, what's your best guess with uh, age tech and, and aging in place and, and these sorts of remote home monitoring technologies? Is this going to be high growth, medium growth? Are you guys bullish on this or is this something you're kind of taking it by one day at a time? Well, we're certainly we're certainly bullish on the sector. And, and this year we'll see over $12 billion invested into digital health writ large. 
Um, I, I do think that there are some needs and opportunities that will be addressed through use of these types of offerings on a go forward basis. Um, first and foremost, and would love Sheila's perspective on this, um, relates to behavioral health, uh, mental wellness. Um, it's, I think, a, an outgrowth of this pandemic that we are going to see um, post-traumatic pandemic disorder um, that is going to require significant services from mental health professionals. And there's a meaningful shortage of professionals in this area. And in particular, seniors who are dealing with loneliness, isolation, um, some of the challenges that have been brought forward by this disease, loss of friends and family because of it, um, they have needs that are frankly compounded um, by what we're seeing with this pandemic. And I also believe that use of, of digital offerings for mental wellness, like uh, what we've seen with emotional response therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy, um, telehealth with, with a therapist, actually eases the opportunity for individuals to access more of those services. Um, the, the second thing, just to mention briefly, um, because the notion of access uh, brings this to mind, is the huge amount of disparity that we've seen across populations that this pandemic has highlighted, in particular in our black and brown communities. And, and I think that um, the uh, notion of, of health equity um, is something that digital health can help resolve. And that also is true across senior populations. Um, when you think about those who have been impacted more so by this condition, those who are isolated in rural communities or in our urban poor, um, we need to find ways to get better access to them. And solving this digital divide is going to be an important part of what we achieve over the course of the next five years. But Sheila, I, I wanted to turn it over to you with your thoughts. Yeah, so at the start of um, the pandemic, our team stood up a site called ARP Community Connections to deal with what you mentioned, Lee, which was focused on seniors and social isolation. So ARP Community Connections is focused on providing mutual aid groups as well as resources. We also went old school. We went to the telephone. It was, we have something called ARP Friendly Voices where you can have a volunteer who's trained just make a, a call. And so this was one of the, a simple way of having and dealing with social isolation in the immediate need. And this was a, a, um, a site and experience that we stood up in four days, like the pandemic hit and we were scrambling to figure out something that we could do and that that was something that we put in place. Outside of that, one of the startups that we've worked with and we've co-created solutions around um, and with is a, a startup called Rendeavor. And they are focused on virtual reality and their connection to the virtual reality headsets was connecting it in senior living um, centers, but it was also about connecting it at home. Um, we know that there's opportunities for for seniors to stay connected with relatives. Someone in, grandma in Florida can connect with her grandchild in Chicago and grandchild in New York in this virtual reality platform. So we co-created something called Alcove where they can do anything from virtual yoga together to playing virtual games, to traveling and having different kinds of experiences. Social isolation is big. There are still huge needs in this space. Lee, I agree with you that there's going to be post-traumatic pandemic um, symptoms that um, that are that people are experiencing now and will continue to experience. And so there's still a big need for more solutions in this space. But those are some of the areas. And then um, in terms of disparities work, um, for 2021, we've stood up um, we're standing up new strategies around how do we address all of the different types of disparities around health, around wealth, and we're working towards building out new solutions in that area. That's a, a, a ARP at large initiative. Yeah, and I think, you know, 
again, going back to Scott and what hospitals and the initiatives that they're taking, Scott, have you seen uh, specific hospital consortia or hospital groups or even large, you know, hospitals, either in the Chicago area or otherwise, responding with uh, blanket solutions as a way to help people age in place or help people, you know, remote remote monitor them their, their symptoms to folks in the hospitals? Yes and no. I think a lot of evolution. I mean, there's there's three or four things that were said by your panelists that were magnificent. I, I love sort of um, Sheila's thoughts on sort of people are still trying to figure out, and this is why Kaiser was so far ahead of everybody else, how it's going to get paid. Uh, and, and Sheila's hit this point exactly so well on care navigation, all kinds of different pieces of this aren't reimbursed. And without reimbursed, it's hard for hospitals to move in that direction, even though they know, know, know they need to. So, so what's happened on Medicare reimbursing, you know, telehealth has been a game changer, but still doesn't go that far. And so many other than the navigation things, the assistance type things that are really needed to facilitate these things working well. So hospitals really have to invest in those things, even though they don't get paid for them. The other thing I love that Sheila said is this great mix of setting things up through this mix of blocking and tackling plus enhanced technology, blocking and tackling plus enhanced solutions is sort of this, the, the way to make changes in a lot of this stuff. And it's, it, it's not lost on me, what she talks about is, we had to do this. We had people that had to do this and scrambling to do it. And there's a lot of that still going on in hospitals and health systems. The thing that Lee said on, um, not to transition from the question stand, but what Lee said about mental health is right on it. I mean, that is the area that is so overserved and so underserved in our country in so many ways. Everybody realizes it's so underserved. It was realized it was underserved before this. We have vast shortages of behavioral health providers. We have vast shortages of all types of providers. And the hope is that, you know, that somehow or another telehealth technology will help bridge that gap. There is just still a great shortage of all types of providers. But there are a lot of things that can be done by non-providers that if with the right technology and so forth, that can help on a lot of issues that you don't need the education of an MD to do a lot of things that can really help bridge some of these gaps. And, and so I thought that um, Lee's point on mental health is, is the one that I hear the most about. This is where there's such a huge gap in, in addition to shortages of providers. And then Perry's point speaks to the enormity of the problem that if 30% of the world's population is elderly, it's, it's again, it's not like telehealth is health, uh, serving the elderly is health. And this is a great challenge. And it goes back to something that everybody has said, or I've heard so much, I hear so much about, is shortages of providers, shortages of clinicians. And, and just even if you have coverage, if we don't have the vast numbers of providers we need, we won't have access. And so there are a lot of different challenges. I think hospitals are still in the sort of, um, you know, when, when you talk about segmenting things and it's been talked about, uh, but hospitals houses are just really getting there. I mean, the ones that were not there already, I mean, you've seen, Hospitals that are really highly at risk had already done a lot to segment their populations to really make sure they're providing the right level of follow-up to patients that ultimately cost the system a lot of money to try and avoid emergency problems that can avoid huge cost problems. But for everybody else that's in the largely a fee-for-service world, hospitals are still scrambling to get there and trying to figure it out it is the best I see it. And Glenn may have, a, or not Glenn, I think of Glenn Pullman and Lee Sparrow as interchangeable, and excuse me, Lee. Um, but I think when I when I you guys might have a better sense of where health systems are at on this, but I do see still the the it still is a, a, a quick acceleration and evolution, and I'm so impressed by the work of, quite frankly, everybody on the call, Sheila, Perry, and Lee. It's amazing what you're doing and have done. Yeah, agreed. And and Lee, just to we've got a few minutes left, and I'll go around and 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 we'll do a uh, we'll do a like a, a a 20 second 30 second uh answer for each one of you on this and start with lee obviously uh since he's on the zoom screen in front of me uh around the horn here uh you know it's lee 24 from... by 7 i'm on your zoom screen <laughs> you get that way isn't it it's getting crazy uh, but just you know talking about this and talking about uh you know to sum up in about 30 seconds uh, of of what we're looking at here um, you know, how, how will this ultimately integrate into what we're seeing in IntelliDoc and Lavongo and that merger was a big part of this, which is a, a much more virtualized healthcare system. And that, that resonance that, that you and Glenn always talk about, about, you know, just making everything frictionless 
whether it's things like, you know, what Livongo does for its patients and just getting the strips there before they even need them because they're running low and your, your machine learning is detecting that. Or if it's, some, you know, something like, you know, being able to uh, go onto Google and use something as frictionless as a Google search for a symptom. Um, how, at the end of the day, what's your, what's your viewpoint? Again, 30 seconds or less of how this all clicks together. Well, I, I think that we are um, at, a, at a time where we're seeing a convergence between um, great consumer design and, and health. And it's about time that, that we came forward with this. Um, no one has to teach us how to use a Google search engine. No one had to teach us how to use an app uh, for, for Uber. Um, I recently, in order to improve my connectivity so I don't lose my connection during all my Stan Hachnowski Zoom calls, um, set up a mesh network in my house open up the box, plug it in, download the app, set it up. It's that easy. And, and what Perry and, and, and others like him are doing um, will allow seniors who know technology, the 10,000 people a day, the baby boomers who are aging in to Medicare are using iPhones. They're using Android devices. They're using Samsung G watches. Like they have connectivity in their lives they're using it to communicate with friends and the like. And, and I think that the opportunity to bring these technologies into the home and collect data with permission, with security, both passively and amb ambiently, as well as actively, um, is going to improve health for those over 65. That's great. And uh, Scott, just going around the horn uh, as, as you guys are appearing on the Zoom screen. <sighs> Well, I think Lee has hit it so right, actually. He's, he's actually, I can see why he's been so successful and so brilliant. I mean, he's hit it exactly right. This, this is an evolution in progress. It, it's moving well. There is so much institutional learning and people learning from each other versus from, you know, from, and, there, and there's so much problem solving going on. It's something Sheila mentioned, something Perry mentioned, this concept of like the mesh network. I would never have known what a mesh network was till April and all my Zoom calls started falling. Now, of course, like, like we and others, we now have a mesh network in the home, which I would never know what it is. But it's really you, people learn very, very quickly as a community once things start to take hold. And I think that's a lot where this is going, where as these things take hold, like nobody knew, knew how to use Uber. Now our kids showed us how to use Uber. We know how to use Uber. And I think there will be just vast, vast acceleration. And I, and I guess I should look at it in the positive side. 80% plus of people 65 and over use cell phones, use them well, and probably more than that have some kind of surface, some kind of iPad. So I think this will accelerate well. And, and, I, and, I, and I, I can't sort of like speak highly enough of the efforts of what the ARP is doing and what Perry is doing and just also this concept of, um, you know, the, the, the learning from each other is the acceleration of this with great tools and people. And, and people are critical, the, the glue to hold it together. So yeah, thank you, Stan. No, thank you, Scott. And again, you know, 30 seconds or so, Perry, how do you, uh, how do you see this coming together and fitting together with the uh, virtual healthcare system and, uh, and, and being able to tie it together easily? It reminds me of the time where, you know, where we, we thought that the hotspot on our smartphone, Android and Apple devices will replace their home router. <laughs> because we said, oh, you know, we don't need to be always connected. We can use the hotspot on our phone and people were can canceling their home internet service. And then the smart TV came in and they demanded full-time connections and other things that are demanding full-time connection. And the smartphone has a threshold. It has a slip mode and the cell phone manufacturer, smartphone manufacturers and all these Android and Apple devices have a threshold of how much do you really want you to spend on a device. So they take into consideration battery life. They take into consideration that they want you to spend screen time. They want you to spend as, as, many, as, as, as long as you can on your phone. And how do they do that? They're creating, and I, I know it's 30 seconds, but I'll say they're creating a flow that make you addicted to all these presses. Uh, I, I'll admit it first. I'm addicted to checking my emails and checking my WhatsApp. Okay, that, that's my way to connect to my business and my friends. Uh, it, it's not gonna work when it comes to the elderly. They need to, things need to be fully automated. And uh, if, if smartphone was the solution, we wouldn't be able to increase compliance by 60% up. So, so uh, similar to how the internet connection at home is, is everything connected right now. Uh, we can just every time we walk home to take our phone and connect our smart TV to it and connect our Wi-Fi connections. You have one device that connects uh, everything all the time and keep you alive. Same thing with, uh, with the peripherals, with the wearables. Uh, 
uh, it gets to a point where there must be one single data point that always listening, always alerting, and that's what we're all about. And thank you, thank you for uh, uh, putting this panel together. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, and thanks for joining us, seriously. And, and, and Sheila, take us home. You're you're in the, you know one of the <laughs> probably the premier age tech lab in America and the world with ARP Innovation Labs. What uh, how how are you all seeing? Some of the the age tech fit within this emerging virtual healthcare system and, and and really come together to make it as easy as Google and Amazon, as Glenn and Lee like to talk about. Uh, it's you know really reinventing the consumer healthcare and, and the the fifty plus healthcare experience. Well, everything that Perry, Scott, and Lee said, I'm just going to say ditto to that. Um, but I, I was going to look at it from two routes. From the consumer standpoint, we're seeing that consumers have more tools to take more control and be informed about their health. As Lee mentioned, there's disparities. And so there's a way, there's a need for more affordability in that area. But it is critical for players in the healthcare space to make this simpler, to make it easier because of the, the big tech five. They are here, they are pushing the doors. I came from the financial service space I saw all the big disruptions there. I came from the retail space, saw the big disruptions there. The, those disruptions are happening now in healthcare and the healthcare providers and the players in this field need to continue to run faster to meet the demands that are happening today. Brilliantly said, and thank you, Sheila, for that, uh, that conclusionary statement, really. And thank you uh, to all the distinguished uh, panelists in today's uh, extraordinary panel. I, I, you know, just the, the nuances of what each of you have brought to today's discussion are extraordinary. And again, remember for the audience out there, if you didn't get your question answered, link into these folks. They are eminently accessible. I'm, I'm always shocked at how all of these people are so they're so busy, and yet they, uh, whether it's LinkedIn, LinkedIn, or email or whatever, they're very accessible, and and they really are trying to transform the healthcare system each in their own ways. And uh, thank you, everyone. Have a great night and. Uh, thank you to Aperture uh, for hosting this and sponsoring this program. And uh, please do stay safe, stay warm, and have a great holidays. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much.